This is Burlington, and here we are in the Channel 17 newsroom in Burlington, Vermont, uh, for our ongoing Nuclear Free Future conversation. And viewers, uh, welcome with me, our guest today, Arnie Gunderson, here in the studio with me. Welcome, Arnie. Hi, Margaret. Nice to be back. Nice to be back here with you, Arnie. And you're the chief engineer of Fairwinds Energy Education. And together, we can welcome our friend Kevin Camps, from Beyond Nuclear, and you're you're uh, you're a guest. You have been a guest here a few times before, and we welcome you back, Kevin. Thank you so Thank much. You, yes. Hello, Arnie. Hi, Kevin. How are you? So, at this at this uh, at this time, uh, we have just uh, experienced the closing of Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant here in Vermont. The date was December 31st. 2000, 29th. T December 29th, yes. At 12, 12 p.m., some say. Okay. So, and our subject here is Vermont Yankee Postmortem. Environment, health and safety, question mark. Economics, question mark. Activism, question mark. With my two guests. So, uh, right off, we'll, we'll plunge into it with... Uh, Questions about what are what are the repercussions of the closing of Vermont Yankee? Because I, the public, and I am a member of the public here, we have learned from one of the most apolitical articles in National Geographic that the Vermont nuclear power plant, which sits along the banks of the Connecticut River in Vernon, Vermont, shut down in the face of price competition from natural gas, period. That's the first paragraph. It stands there. And uh, wh what do you say to that? Arnie. Well, th there's no doubt that there's price competition uh, from natural gas, but also from renewables. Um, and uh, if you want to shut down your local nuke, the best thing you can do is put a solar panel on your roof. And the reason for that is that it reduces the peak demand. And that's how nuclear power makes all its money is by uh, uh, at the peak. So if you put a solar collector on your roof, you're making a statement that will uh, put financial pressure on nuclear. But yeah, natural gas is low, and uh, utilities around the country are threatening to shut down their nuclear plant unless we pay higher electric rates. Um, they're basically, they're saying that we need to subsidize nuclear power by paying more uh, for electricity. And that's the argument Energy made. We can't make money, so we're shutting it down. And here in Vermont, they're, uh, the Vernon, the town that uh, Vermont Yankee is in, is saying, oh, how sad we're losing all these good people, um, and it was a perfectly good plant. You know, the fact of the matter is it was a very expensive plant, and uh, if we wanted to keep it running, we'd have to pay more than we can from other sources. When, uh, when Entergy was making money, uh, they didn't give it back, and uh, for the last year they were losing money, and they decided it was time to pull the plug. The money was part of it, but, but it wasn't everything, and I think Kevin really was a major contributor to the uh, overall issue. Right. Uh, Kevin, can you speak to that about how much money uh, Vermont Yankee used to, to run the plant? And it was taxpayer money also, the tax incentive programs and all of that. Well, thank you, Arnie, for your kind words. But it was really my honor and privilege to kind of show up at the high moments in Vermont. And, you know, it was an honor to testify at the Vermont State Legislature, and I did get to see your presentation to the legislators about the uh, misstatements, shall we say, under oath by Entergy officials to State of Vermont officials, and uh, I was also there for the, the big protest, uh, March 22nd of 2012, the first day of the license extension that was so controversial. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would have to correct you, I'm afraid. It was really the grassroots activists of Vermont many of whom were at this for over four decades. And the party in Greenfield, Massachusetts on January 3rd that just took place, a lot of those folks were there. And I looked around the room at one point, there were probably 150 people there despite the severe weather conditions outside. And it dawned on me that if you did the person years or the activism years in that room, you were talking many centuries of activism put together there. And I really love this uh, op-ed that Bob Beatty of the Safe and Green campaign put out just after Entergy announced its decision to permanently close Vermont Yankee, so it would have been published in early September of 2013. It was titled, What Killed the Beast? And he had a King Kong metaphor going. And his answer was, it was the beauty of people power that killed the beast, because what forced Entergy 
to have to compete on the spot market? Well, it was the people of Vermont and Western Massachusetts and nearby in New Hampshire who got elected officials in the state of Vermont in the right place on this issue. And that led to the utilities of Vermont, you know, having a very strong stand when they negotiated with Entergy. Not one watt of electricity from Vermont Yankee has been used or sold in Vermont itself for years now. And that was people power in action. You know, I think it, it, you're right. You know, Entergy had five nukes that are in trouble. There's Pilgrim in Massachusetts. There's Palisades in Michigan. Uh, there's Indian Point right in, in New York City. And the, they chose to shut down Vermont Yankee. And I think it was because uh, not just activism, but we are smarter because of activism in Vermont. The, the nuclear issues have constantly been raised, uh, and the populace in Vermont is very smart, and the political uh, office holders are also very smart. So um, we just didn't get pushed around by Entergy like they seem to be able to push people around in New York State. I didn't really answer your question, Margaret, about the costs, but the nuclear power industry has a very bad habit of trying to uh, send the bill to the people, whether it's to the ratepayers on their electricity bills or to the taxpayers, and Entergy is pretty infamous at that. Entergy has kind of an unwritten business model of buying reactors dirt cheap and then running them into the ground. And I'm from Michigan, so I'm more familiar with their behavior at Palisades since 2007 when they took over there. They have some major safety-related systems and structures and components that the previous owner promised the state and the population of Michigan would be fixed when this wonderful company from New Orleans called Entergy took over. Well, um, I'm working with Arnie and others right now on the worst embrittled reactor pressure vessel in the country at Palisades. Entergy has done nothing to address that problem other than try to lobby the NRC to weaken the safety regulations. That's one of many examples of Palisades we could cite. So what Entergy does is they pocket the profits they make because they do make a lot of money from electricity sales. Not everywhere, though. Not at, a, not at Vermont Yankee recently. But at Palisades, they do. They're not putting that back into maintenance. And we live in dire risk downwind because of that. You know, Entergy was calling these plants cash cows for years. They were calling them cash cows. And uh, just for the last year or two, uh, with um, the, the gas market and renewables displacing it, uh, now they're bemoaning the fact. You know, we've got uh, politicians in throughout New England, but in Vernon especially, who are saying, oh, woe is us. We've, uh, the, those, those bad activists have, have shut down a perfectly good nuclear reactor. And over the 40 years where my Yankee was running, it's been, uh, there, there's been 440 nuclear reactors built. Five of them have had meltdowns. So one out of every 100 nuclear plants melts down. Um, that's not the kind of neighbor I want. I mean, I don't walk across the street when I know the odds are going to be one in 100. I'll get run over by a bus. Um, so actually, I'm really happy that Vermont Yankee shut down um, because now we are not in the nuclear crosshairs. We, uh, uh, we've managed to escape the likelihood of a meltdown. Vermont Yankee was identical to the design of Fukushima Daiichi, too. So um, it's, a, it's a great day for Vermont. And what, what is the impact in present day, then, upon the environment here in Vermont and the health and safety issues surrounding the decommissioning plant? Well, you know, nu any nuclear plant, nuclear plants are the least efficient way of producing electricity in the world. And that means that they throw out an enormous amount of waste heat. And um, that's why they're always built near rivers or on the ocean. And um, uh, Vermont Yankee has been polluting the Connecticut River for 40 years with its waste heat. And the shad population on the, uh, on the river has declined from 70,000 shad per year down to seven shad per year. That's right, seven. Um, now, shad go out to sea for four years before they come back. So five years from now, we should see the beginning of the shad runs um, begin to build back up again because there's uh, no more thermal uh, pollution to kill the eggs as they're floating down the river. Uh, I think that's a, a major uh, thing to keep on, on the radar 
And I hope that the people in Vernon and people along the Connecticut River recognize that when the shads start to come back in five years, it's because Vermont Yankee is not polluting the river with, with thermal pollution. That's a big deal. Yeah, So, and that would indicate other uh, health concerns that are brought up with, with uh, the running of, of the Vermont Yankee, including thyroid problems and, and radiation uh, from, uh, for the, especially the young population around the, uh, the power plant. Well, um, that reminds me of conversations I had in Greenfield again. I was up in Vermont for the celebrations this past couple weeks, and uh, I learned a lot from folks who have watchdog Vermont Yankee for so long. And one of the things that just made my draw job was how close the elementary school in Vernon is to the atomic reactor. And I did stop by there and saw it with my own eyes. Yes. I mean, it's several hundred yards at most. Yes. And I learned that Vermont Yankee, even from the earliest days, had to put in radiation shielding between the reactor and the school to cut down on the gamma dose that the children would experience. And then when they got the power up rate, the 20% power up rate, which is one of the biggest in the country, they had to increase the shielding so that uh, the children would not get a, a large dose. But those risks now, those concerns continue because one of the first things that's going to happen in the weeks ahead is they're going to offload what's in the core, the irradiated fuel. We're talking a large quantity into the pool. And we've seen recent reports from Europe, especially where the radiation releases that occur often occur when they take the lid off and move fuel around. So that's a concern. Then you got many hundreds of tons of irradiated fuel in the storage pool at Vermont Yankee. That's still a very significant risk. And then you've got the bad contamination of that site that uh, has to be cleaned up. But that school right there and then right across the river, there's another elementary school. And so Citizens Awareness Network has started to raise that concern that when someday they start moving fuel, when they start dismantling the facilities, uh, we saw that happen in Japan at Fukushima Daiichi Unit 3 during dismantlement of the rubble at Unit 3 the carelessness of Tokyo Electric, they caused a large release of radioactivity airborne that fell out over a long distance, contaminating rice crops, for example. So there's still a lot of vigilance required at Vermont Yankee. You know, the, um, um, the reactor shut down. So <clears throat> that doesn't mean that the radiation goes away. There's um, the nuclear fuel pool will have the equivalent of about 700 nuclear bombs worth of radioactivity in it for the next five years. And eventually that will be taken out of the fuel pool and put into canisters which then are lowered to the ground and will be stored for perhaps 50 or 60 years and maybe even longer. So uh, the process of lifting those heavy canisters out and moving them onto the ground um, has a lot of problems associated with it. Uh, viewers may remember back about four years ago, one of those canisters uh, the brakes on the heavy crane failed at Vermont Yankee, and the canister started to slide down, and they couldn't stop it. Mm -hmm. So um, it's uh, until that fuel is out of the fuel pool and until the, um, uh, the building is essentially emptied of radiation, um, we're still at risk. And Entergy's reaction to that is to eliminate the emergency plan starting next year. They don't want to do emergency planning at Vermont Yankee. And what that means, of course, is that the risk is being carried by the people who live near Vermont Yankee, but Entergy saves some money by not having to have an emergency staff on hand. And so this emergency plan means the evacuation route, et cetera, for the people living near there, among other things, right? And I would give credit to Senator Sanders from Vermont alongside Senator Markey from Massachusetts and Senator Boxer from California who were in the majority and so they were able to hold a lot of sway at you know the last few years of Environment and Public Works Committee um, hearings on nuclear matters in the U.S. Senate. That's all changed now that the Republicans are in the majority and Senator Boxer's announced a retirement but they made a really big deal about that point that Arnie just raised where shut down nuclear power plants, which in recent years have included Kewanee, Wisconsin, and Crystal River, Florida, San Onofre units two and three in California. It's another bad habit of the nuclear power industry to apply to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission 
for these exemptions from emergency preparedness, even though the irradiated fuel is still in the pool. And, and they get it. They get a rubber stamp to do away with these um, important plans for evacuation, while at the same time the NRC assumes in its studies of the risks of pool fires that nobody's going to get hurt because everybody's going to evacuate very quickly and safely. And so they're talking out both sides of their mouth. And it was so bad at San Onofre that the company, um, Southern California Edison, actually let go of its security guard force without informing the NRC, despite the fact that their pools are full of catastrophically dangerous nuclear waste. Now, you bring up the NRC, and we, 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 the public perceives the NRC as the great oversight of this de- decommissioning plant. So, uh, and recently the NRC made a decision about the storage of nuclear waste. Could, could you explain that more to me, Arnie? Well, I'll touch on the oversight issue. Um, you know, the NRC is a captured agency. The, there's five commissioners, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, so those five commissioners are appointed by Congress. And Congress has always appointed pro-nuclear commissioners. So the five guys running it, five people running it, there's, there, there uh, was two women, now there's one. Uh, that team is essentially rubber stamping what the nuclear industry wants to have done. And the staff of about 4,000 people get the message that you don't get promoted in the NRC if you support the public, you get promoted in the NRC if you support the industry. So the pressures on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission are to lower the costs of nuclear. They all know that if they're too um, rigid in their interpretation of the law, that the, the nuclear plant's going to go out of business. And five in the last year, five nuclear plants have gone out of business. So, And there's 20 others that are right on the cusp. So these these company, I'm sorry, the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff is fully aware that if they're too tough, 20 more plants will likely collapse, and that's going to mean somebody at the NRC is going to lose their job. So they've got a, um, a conflict of interest at the NRC, and they're not looking out for us. They're looking out for the nuclear industry. Can you speak to that, Kevin? I know you are the nuclear waste watchdog, and uh, you, you, uh, when you have appeared on this, this program before and in many other places, but uh, what, what do you say about the newest nu- nuclear NRC decision about nuclear waste, and specifically at Vermont Yankee? Yeah, that's a funny choice of words. You, you said oversight at NRC, and English is a yeah. funny language. So there's two definitions of oversight. One means to look very carefully at something, and the opposite as well, to, to miss something by not looking very carefully, and oversight. NRC is infamous for its oversights, (laughs) Mm. and one of them is this question you ask about nuclear waste confidence, this Orwellian term, literally from 1984 when NRC first put the policy out, where NRC effectively said, hey, nuclear industry, make as much high-level radioactive waste as you want because we have confidence that it can be safely stored at the reactors for decades or longer. And then we have confidence, too, that there will be a dump site someday where we can just sweep it under the rug. So go ahead, make as much as you want, without even doing an environmental impact statement for all these decades. And they could not get away with that anymore after June 8th of 2012, when a coalition of states, including Vermont and New York, and a coalition of some three dozen environmental groups, took them to court, and the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals said, you know what? Uh, these folks are right, NRC, you need to do an environmental impact statement on the generation and the storage of high-level radioactive waste. And so they went through the motions. They did a very shallow uh, environmental impact statement. They effectively ignored tens of thousands of public comments from hearings around the country. And again, they changed the name, but they kept the policy. Now they call it continued storage of spent nuclear fuel, They've incredibly said it's safe at the reactor sites for decades, if not centuries, into the future, and they have not put a date certain on a repository, and it's going to go back to court is what's going to happen. In fact, there are a bunch of licensing decisions that are poised for finalization now by the NRC. Davis Specy, where we've worked with Arnie, uh, Callaway, Missouri, any number, Fermi 3, where we've worked with uh, Arnie in Michigan. As soon as NRC makes its move to grant those licenses, then again, the coalition of environmental groups for sure, and hopefully that coalition of states, which have their own duty to protect their own 
uh, constituents will take action, seek an injunction against that licensing decision. This uh, has finally caught up with NRC after all these decades. You know, when, when I went to school uh, and all these plants were being built, no one thought you'd be storing nuclear waste at a nuclear reactor. The theory was that within five years, the fuel would be uh, shipped out to be reprocessed. Well, reprocessing has been a colossal failure, and uh, there are no reprocessing facilities in the United States right now, and the one in France is not doing very well either. And so what has happened is that um, the plants have become uh, constipated. You know, the, there's no place to put the fuel. They can't ship it away, so they keep stuffing more and more and more into these nuclear fuel pools. Um, the fuel pools are full. Now they're saying, well, we'll take it out of the fuel pool and we'll put it on the ground and we'll store it for, as Kevin said, you know, decades if not centuries. Mm -hmm. That was not the plan when these nuclear plants were built. The plan was in 50 years, uh, in five years rather, that fuel would be on its way to be reprocessed. So the, that process was a total failure, reprocessing. And uh, now we're stuck, stuck with the legacy of decisions made in the 60s that the fuel pools would only have three to five years worth of fuel in them. Yeah. Well, when we're talking about uh, the activism and uh, the public, I think that uh, the public and, and, I, and I as a member of the public, we have to struggle and reach out to people uh, such as you, Kevin, and you, Arnie, to understand what's going on. Because I, again, cite the National Geographic article, and uh, they say, as another nuclear power plant closed this week, the United States faced a dwindling fleet of aging reactors, few new projects, and the challenge of safely mothballing, mothballing radioactive fuel for decades. So <laughs> this is what we, the public, are hearing, that, that they're mothballing as though, well, when I mothball something in my closet, it, it's to use it at a different time or to sell it or something like that. So mothballing as, the, as a common word yeah. is, <clears throat> well, speak to that for me. Well, there's a, there's a brilliant movie uh, that you can, yeah, you can get on uh, uh, pretty much any of the, the, the uh, <clears throat> computer, the places you buy movies over the computer. It's called Into Eternity. And it's about the storage of nuclear waste in uh, Finland. And they talk about building this facility and how difficult it is to design something that has to store nuclear material for longer than there have been humans on the Earth. You have to keep this stuff stored in the ground for a quarter of a million years. Then they talk about how language has changed. And do you put big warning signs up telling people to stay away? Then in what language? When a thousand years from now, people won't be able to read it. Then the flip side of that is if you put a warning sign up, then the next person who has, um, who is not a nice guy, the next Hitler or something like that, will say, well, there's plutonium down there and I can make bombs and I know where to drill. So if you warn you actually invite people whose motives are, are, are not pristine to drill in the future. We're talking about a problem that's going to be with us longer than mankind has been on the planet. And talk about back to the future. Uh, the United States effectively is in the year 1957 when it comes to high-level radioactive waste, which was when the powers that be, the National Academy of Sciences, the federal government, first put out a report that said deep geologic disposal, that's the way to go. It's going to be easy. In the meantime, we'll reprocess. We're back to 1957. We have no answer. Uh, Yucca Mountain was the illusion of a solution, as Michael Keegan with Don't Waste Michigan puts it. As long as there was an illusion of a solution, be it reprocessing Yucca Mountain as a dump site, go ahead. We have confidence. Make as much waste as you want. And here we go again. The Republicans in Congress uh, are very uh, fixated, obsessed with the Yucca Mountain dump because their paymasters in the nuclear power industry, where they get their campaign contributions from, want it. They want Yucca Mountain. They want centralized interim storage, which we call parking lot dumps on a regional basis, which are surface storage. They're targeting Department of Energy sites, Native American reservations, nuclear power plant sites. Uh, it's crazy. It's uh, chaos. Uh, we refer to it as mobile Chernobyl, these trucks and trains and barges that would move the waste to these places. And it was a tremendous grassroots victory in Nevada, working with people across the country 
to stop Yucca Mountain. I mean, it came very close, sometimes down to a single vote in the United States Senate, like in 2000. A single vote sustained President Clinton's veto against the Yucca Mountain dump. But we did, and we've held off that dump for decades. They're going to come at us again in this new congressional session, and we will beat them again because it's too dangerous. It's a disaster if they get away with it because it's an earthquake zone at Yucca. It's a volcanic zone. There's a lot of water flow through that landscape that would release the radioactivity in massive quantities over time. So we have to stop it. We have no choice. You know, the, the decision to build at Yucca Mountain was not scientific. Uh, when the bill passed Congress, it was affectionately called the Screw Nevada Bill because Nevada didn't have many representatives and basically everybody else didn't want it in their backyard, so they screwed Nevada. Um, and now, even if Yucca Mountain were to be built, there's not enough storage space at Yucca Mountain for the fuel from Vermont Yankee. So we now have to look for another mountain to store our nuclear waste in as well. So uh, uh, it was a political decision and not a scientific one. And now we're trying to ramrod through um, what, what scientists don't really think is a great idea. We know that first site search back in the early 80s, because the Nuclear Waste Policy Act was passed in 1983, they were sniffing around Vermont. There were seven sites in granite-rich Vermont and another two over in New Hampshire, one up in Maine. They were The Department of Energy was sniffing around the Northeast, and they got chased out of there, just like they got chased out of other, other parts of the country. And, you know, Nevada got ganged up on. Like Arnie said, they only had one member of the U.S. House, and, of course, they had two senators, but they were both rookies. But the nuclear establishment messed with the wrong rookie senator, Harry Reid, and they never foresaw Reid becoming Senate Majority Leader. They never foresaw Las Vegas growing uh to such a large population, and it really backfired on them. But here we go again, you know, uh, they're, they're going to start targeting uh, the path of least resistance. And what's really scandalous is that many times that takes the form of Native American reservations. We fought a bitter struggle for years uh, working with the traditionals at the Skull Valley Goshoot Indian Reservation, people like Marjean Bull Creek and uh, Sammy Black Bear, to fend off a parking lot dump targeted at them by the nuclear power industry. And we, we succeeded, but the wounds were deep. And, uh, you know, it was a happy ending, but the, the wounds in that community, because lots of money was being dangled before them, are, are, are still there. So what, what, is the, what is the prospect here in Vermont on the site of, of Vermont Yankee? And what is the burden to to uh, Vermonters and to Americans across the country with, with this decommissioning of the site? Well, for, but, yeah, for, for five years, the major buildings will have to stay intact because the fuel is in the nuclear fuel pool and it's not going anywhere for five years. After five years, they can empty all of the fuel in the nuclear fuel pool and get it on the ground, at which point you've got a carcass. And that carcass at any point can be removed after that. Of course, the problem is there's not enough money. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission allows Entergy and other power plants to take 60 years to remove the carcass. So here's a plant that ran for 43 years, and you're allowed 60 years to clean it up. There's nothing in science why 60 years is a good idea, but the, uh, the reason is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission wants to make nuclear power cheap. So they invest this money in the stock market, and they believe that over 60 years, the money will grow and there'll be enough to get rid of the carcass. So we'll have a radioactive carcass of a power plant even after the nuclear fuel is on the ground. Likely, there'll be eventually enough money in maybe 2040 uh, to, uh, to begin to dismantle the plant. And by 2050, I'll be 101, um, the, uh, the, the carcass should be gone and ship to Texas. So Texas is the dump that Vermont will send its nuclear power plant to. But the nuclear fuel will remain there until there's a place to store it, which could be 100 years. And that waste control specialist's dump site in West Texas, right on the New Mexico border, there's another bad habit of the nuclear industry to really, through, through corruption, 
and radioactive waste dumps. And so Waste Control Specialists was founded by a, a billionaire in Texas and really bought his way through the permitting process at the uh, Texas Environmental Agency. Several uh, career-long staffers at the Environmental Agency in Texas resigned their positions over decisions or a dump. One of the biggest concerns being that it's right on the edge, if not on top of the Oglala Aquifer, which is essential drinking and irrigation water for a dozen states on the Great Plains. And now it's become a national radioactive waste dump for so-called low-level radioactive wastes. And in fact, I mentioned those parking lot dumps. Uh, Waste Control Specialists has thrown its hat in the ring. They would love to be the parking lot dump for the high-level radioactive waste of the United States. And similar behavior very close to the Skull Valley Ghost Chutes Indian Reservation, which was targeted for a high-level waste parking lot dump. Just down the road, some tens of miles, is EnviroCare, another Orwellian name. It's now Energy Solutions. Again, founded, uh, opened through corruption. The question before the jury in that court case was, state official is the bribe or did the owner of the dump bribe the state official? And the jury found in favor of the founder of the dump, and the state official went to jail. We're talking cash, we're talking gold, we're talking jewels, literally. And so these dumps are, are founded on, on criminal misbehavior, and, uh, and they leak. And so it's a crime against the planet and against uh, society. And it's placed in an area where the incomes are very low. So the people want the jobs, and you know, the, the hell with it. If it leaks in 50 years, that's something. I, I've got my paycheck. I'm retired. I may be dead. Uh, that's the next generation's problem. Uh, the nuclear industry has a tradition of siting these dumps in areas where the income is very low, and people are desperate for work and are willing to overlook the environmental impacts that the legacy issues That'll carry on for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Yes. So the prospect and what we, we, we the public, can't look forward to green fields, a green field down there at the site no. of Vermont Yankee. <clears throat> Vermont Yankee this will is... look like it looks now till mm. oh, 2040. And by 2050, the, the horizon won't show the power plant. However, there'll be a, a fenced-in area with bright lights shining down on it for security uh, where the nuclear fuel is stored potentially till the, till the 22nd century. And, and I will put a, just a one thing out there, and this comes from Big Rock Point in Michigan, which is now controlled by Entergy because Entergy took over at Palisades in West Michigan. They also got Big Rock Point thrown in as a part of the package deal. A small 70-megawatt electric experimental very early prototype reactor which uh they they declared it a green field they dismantled the facilities they supposedly cleaned up to a shallow depth in the soil there is still plutonium in the soil in the groundwater and especially in the sediments of lake michigan where nrc entergy and the previous owner the state of michigan have not bothered to even look in the sediments of lake michigan where Big Rock Point discharged through a canal radioactivity and toxic chemicals for decades on end, 35 years of operations. So when they say greenfield, there is lingering radioactive contamination, and that's a part of the vigilance that's going to have to go on. They had those bad tritium leaks and other radioactive poisons at Vermont Yankee that got into the soil and groundwater. That's got to get cleaned up, and if, the, if Entergy and the contractor it hires to do the decommissioning can get away with it, they will pocket the money and not go down very deep at all. You know, it's important to note that if, if there's any money left over, Entergy gets half, and the ratepayers of the state of Vermont get half. So it's in Entergy's best interest not to dig very deep to look for these problems because they make half of the excess. Um, I've, I've advised the state that we had that leak, and the ground is still contaminated. And... Um, um, we should immediately destroy that building and clean the soil under that building. Because what's happening now is over the next 40 years, that, that radiation is going to move toward the river. And it will be much more expensive 40 years now uh, down the road than it is now to clean up. So um, that one building that had the severe leak could easily be cleaned up next year and eliminate any future contamination of the Connecticut River. 
Entergy doesn't want to do that. Who has the power to, uh, to address energy face-to-face uh, -face and convince them that they must do these things for the, for the good of the people? Well, that came up a lot during the celebrations, which I should hasten to add were also strategy sessions. I mean, you get a bunch of uh, concerned citizens together, like the environmental and anti-nuclear movement of the Northeast, and it, even at a party, they're trying to figure out which reactor is next to focus on, and also how to stay vigilant at Vermont Yankee. And that question of how to hold Entergy's feet to the fire during the decommissioning how to hold NRC's feet to the fire during the decommissioning was raised. And I kept pointing out to people that, you know, shutting down Vermont Yankee was a miracle, right? We weren't, as the people, uh, supposed to have that power. <laughs> and people did it anyway. They insisted on it, and they saw it through and made it happen. And so the same kind of courage and vision will have to be applied now to the decommissioning process. People have to stay in there attend all the meetings, uh, read all the documents. It's a Herculean task, and uh, if anybody can do it, it's the folks who've already forced the shutdown of Vermont Yankee. Yeah. And Ferens is working on a report commissioned by the Lintelac Foundation uh, to look at Vermont Yankee's decommissioning, and we should have that out by the end of February. Um, okay, we'll that's, that's Fairwinds. Your, your Fairwinds yes. Energy Education is doing this report. Yes, yeah. uh, and it will... Uh, discuss the weaknesses in the NRC's plan and uh, make some recommendations that hopefully we'll get in front of the legislature um, to begin that public oversight of a rogue agency and a rogue company. Uh, it'll uh -huh. be difficult. And what power does the Vermont legislature have at this point? None. <laughs> mm. You know, the power of uh, the bully pulpit, I think, mm -hmm. is, the, is the main key. Yeah. Mm. Kevin, your thoughts? Well, again, you know, I think a little courage goes a long way. And the state of Vermont, uh, Governor Shumlin, the legislature have shown a lot of courage over the years. But they were really kind of given no choice in that matter by the people of Vermont who asked them to do that. <laughs> and they did do it. They really stepped up. They, they need to continue to step up because, you know, there's so many deceptions in this line of work. When when NRC releases the site as a greenfield site for unrestricted reuse, that could mean the growing of crops there. That could mean a maternity ward, a daycare center. In Michigan, again, at Big Rock Point, they were proposing a state park, and they were going to charge the state of Michigan, the people of Michigan, $20 million to take over that property, which is radioactively contaminated with high-level radioactive waste still stored there. They were going to build a museum glorifying the atomic age. And we really had no official voice in the matter, but we said, no way, you know, it ain't happening, and we put a stop to it. The way we did was decisions were about to be made on the funding of that million, and we went to the, uh, the state agency that made those funding decisions, and we said, this can't happen. And by a two-to-one vote, that panel said, no, we're not going to fund the state park glorifying atomic energy on a contaminated site with high-level waste in the middle of it. There's other parks in the state that really deserve funding more than that. So there's creativity and courage are, are what's needed in this democracy of ours. Um, thank you so much, Kevin. And, and now I'm going to ask the last question of you both. Arnie, where do, what do you see as the way forward right now in, in just a, a short... You know, the, 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 we're in a paradigm shift right now, and the uh, the way we used to generate power back in the last century was these large central station power plants. Um, but with the computer, we've been able to shift that. And the paradigm that will be in the next 50 years will be distributed generation, renewables. Um, the collector on my roof, the wind power on a windmill, and we'll be shifting power around. And when there's excess power, it'll go to batteries. And when there's power that's needed, it will leave those batteries. We're in the middle of that paradigm shift, and um, I'm excited about the future. Okay. Thank you, Arnie. And, and Kevin, what's your word on it? I agree. The future is renewables and efficiency. Uh, They'll be nuclear-free by 2022, and they're going to be largely fossil fuel-free by mid-century. And so if Germany, the fourth largest economy in the world, can do it, then we can do it here as well. 
Thank you very much, Kevin Camps of Beyond Nuclear and Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education. And I, I invite you back again to our Nuclear Free Future conversation. And thank you very much for your insights and, and for giving us a, a, a way forward. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Goodbye for now. And thank you, viewers. Hey, thank you. Well, thank you for having me.